Let's pray, first of all. Father, we thank you for your word. And we know that your word is powerful and living and active. And we know that your spirit is necessary for us to have ears to hear and eyes to see. And so we pray for the outpouring of your spirit, Lord. Holy Spirit, we love you. We welcome you here. We yield ourselves to you. We want to be filled with the spirit. We ask you, Father, give of your spirit in our midst. Empower us. Fill us. Be glorified in us. Lord Jesus, may you be exalted here and equip us to go forth for your glory. Convict us of sin. Help us to walk humbly with our God. We love you. I praise you. I pray that you would guide my words, that your word is what would be brought forth, Lord God. And that you would protect me in the speaking and everyone here in the hearing from any errors that I might introduce that you would be glorified and that your word would be faithfully preached. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can turn to Romans chapter 5 if you have your Bible. And if you don't have your Bible, why don't you have your Bible? It's church day. Unless you're my wife who has more kids to hold, in which case you can understand. <laughs> if you got a smartphone... Then you probably have your Bible on your smartphone, too. Romans chapter 5. We're going to talk about exaltation. Not exaltation. Exaltation. Exulting. Rejoicing. In tribulation. Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith. Now, I'm going to stop right there. It didn't get very far. But this is foundational. Therefore, having been justified in faith, by faith. We're getting to the exulting and to the hope, to the joy of the Christian life. Do you need one? I have a pen. Mom has a collection. In order to get to the exaltation, you have to start with the justification. The book of Romans is basically an enormous rhapsody on the gospel. And the first, the context of chapter 5, what he's been talking about so far, you got Romans 1, which talks about all the terrible things that happen when people deny the knowledge of God. And how God gives them over, and they descend into the abyss of unrighteousness. Then you get into chapter 2, Chapter 2 talks about the, the one who passes judgment on others, but also is breaking the law himself. Talks about the hearers and the doers of the law. Get into the Jew being condemned by the law. And then chapter 3, we basically are told it's just a mess. Everybody's guilty. There's none righteous, not even one. Then in chapter 3, it transitions into justification by faith. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So justification, and then he talks about justification through chapter 4 as well. Justification by faith. It's not something that we earn. It's something that God gives us faith. God gives us grace. We trust in Christ and therefore we are justified. And we know that doesn't mean we continue in sin that grace may abound. May it never be. But that's the justification that we're talking about. So we're going to get into the exaltation, the joy in tribulation, but it starts with justification. You have to understand what you have in Christ. You have to understand what it means that you are justified by faith. If you are still under the burden of trying to earn justification, if you are still trying to get secure in your relationship with God because you are good enough now, you're going to have a hard time getting to the exaltation because you're still not getting the justification part. When God says you are justified, that means you are justified. Actually. All the way down. It's a, it, it, that is a legal pronouncement. 
It's not, it's not something on a sliding scale. You're either justified or you're not. You're either guilty or you're not. When, if a judge pronounces someone not guilty, I mean, those are the two options, right? The, the jury can either rule guilty or non-guilty. They can't say, eh, eh, kinda, maybe. That's not how it works. You're either justified or you're not. If you are justified, then you don't need to be thinking like a half-justified person. Because you're not a half-justified. If you've repented of your sins, if you trust in Jesus Christ, then you are no longer under the condemnation or power of sin. You are justified. By faith. That's not something that you have to keep by being a good enough fill-in-the-blank. Now, that is not to deny that we're called to obey God. Absolutely. But our obedience to God has justification as the foundation, not as the thing that we get at the end. If I'm good enough, then I'll be justified. No, I'm justified in Christ. And because of that, I want to walk in obedience to him. You gotta understand that. You gotta meditate on that. I think that's hard for us to get. We, we know it, it's an intellectual reality. I know I'm justified by faith. We're not Catholics. We know, and even Catholics, I think, say that you're justified by faith, but there's some issues in the theology there where it's, it's this combination of you're justified by faith and works. No, you're justified by faith. That faith should produce good works, but don't get the cart before the horse. Too often, we are walking under the burden of misunderstanding the gospel, really. We're burdened and weighed down and do not have joy because our heads are all wrapped up in a bunch of dialogue internally, that would be answered by the gospel. I'm forgiven. I am a new creation in Christ. The Lord is my Father. He's caring for me. He walks with me. He promises to instruct me and teach me. I am justified. I'm safe. I'm secure. Insecurity is something that is talked about a lot in our world. And it's, it's a real thing. It's a real problem. You meet people who are insecure. And what? Do they have peace? Do they have joy? They're constantly on edge. If uh, a spouse is insecure in their marriage and then they go to an event and there's, there's other attractive people around, they're always like keeping an eye on their spouse because they're not secure in their covenant. Something's up there, right? Or if uh, a young person is insecure and they go to, go to school or church or any other social function and do I look as, as cute as that girl over there or am I as strong as that guy over there? There's this constant kind of like wrestling with, am I good enough? Am I good enough? That should not be the heart of a Christian. That should not be our relationship with Christ, right? If you go back to the marriage analogy, if Jesus is our husband and we are justified, we are now in covenant with him. He's not going anywhere. That should plant a seed of peace and security in our hearts. That's unshakable. I am justified by faith. I trust in Christ. I am his Chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation. That's the backdrop. That's the context. Justified by faith. Having been justified by faith. So you can't get the rest of this. You can't get the exaltation part without the justification part. If you're not in Christ, if you have not repented and believed, don't bother trying to get the rest of it. You can't have it without a real relationship with Jesus. Without really knowing him and being known by him. You can't have it. But if you do have it, if you have been justified by faith, then what's next? We have peace with God. Peace with God. The eyes of flesh were so calibrated to this life and what I want in this life. And I want peace with my wife. I want peace with my kids. I want peace with my siblings. I want peace with my government. I want peace with my... And those are all good things. I mean, Scripture tells us to be peacemakers. But what is the primary peace? What is the most important peace? Peace with God. God. Yes. Peace with our God. And if you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, what does that give you? Peace. That's real peace. That's transcendent peace. All those other peace things are more or less on the same field, right? I mean, sure, peace with your wife is more important than peace with a guy on Facebook, right? That's definitely different levels, but it's all human. It's all horizontal. 
Peace with God, that's foundational. That goes down to the core of your being. If you are at peace with God, then come what may, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, your heart is secure. You're at peace with God. It would, do, do, it would be well for us to meditate on that reality. I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ. When you've got the head noise going on, when I've got the head noise going on, and life is stressful, because that happens. It's not like, okay, you're saved. There goes all the problems. Everything is just sunshine and lollipops now. No. So what does it mean we have peace? Does that mean that, I mean, Paul didn't have, talk about a guy who did not have a peaceful life. When he says we have peace, he's clearly not meaning we retire and sit beverages with umbrellas in them and sit in a cute little cottage in the, the Alps. That's not the peace that he's talking about. He's talking about something more foundational at a heart level. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. You stand in grace. The grace of God. You stand in it. That is the atmosphere in which you dwell as a believer. You are surrounded by the grace of God. It is the foundation of your life. You are under his grace. So do you see the picture this is painting of, of our heart, of where our heart should be as Christians? What the gospel lays for us as, us as foundation? I am justified. I have peace with God. I'm no longer under his wrath. He's now my loving father. He cares for me. He loves me. I am standing in his grace. That's not something that I have to maintain because I'm good enough. Because you know what? I didn't get there because I was good enough. That's kind of the point. I was way not good enough. I was extremely bad. And he brought me to life. And forgave me and justified me and stood me right there in the middle of his grace. And if he's the one that did that, and if it's his grace and his justification that made me new, then I don't need to worry about it. I didn't get myself there. I can't keep myself there. Now again, is this, is this permission to sin? Of course not. If you take that and say, oh cool, then I can just sin because I'm good with God now, right? Then you're probably not good with God. You're probably not justified. That's not the speech of a forgiven heart. But you know what? I've got to keep all of God's commandments or he's going to be mad at me. It's also not the speech of a forgiven, forgiven heart. That's not how God is. That's not who God is. We stand in his grace as believers. Are you standing in his grace? This heart that is secure in the grace of God is a heart that spills grace over onto those around. Jesus tells us to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And if our Heavenly Father gives us grace, then that is an example for us to give grace to those around us. So then the question arises, are the, do the people around me feel the grace of God spilling through me onto them? Do I give grace to my children? Or do I look at my children? God looks at me as forgiven and justified, and I look at my children as, you, you better not mess up. Okay, then we got a problem. Our gospel presentation is broken. They're not looking at daddy and seeing a faithful representation of fatherhood. Is my marriage, does that look like Christ in the church? The grace of Christ spilling from husband onto wife and wife onto husband, covering over sins and transgressions and even annoyances, things that might not even be sin. That grace is something that should fill our hearts and our relationships. Okay? So we've obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Our heart is secure. God has lavished all this goodness on us and what's next. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. We exult that's an excited thing. That's an emotional thing. That is a joyful thing. That's not something you just do intellectually. Sometimes you might have to just do it intellectually. When you're having a really rough day, you might have to do some intellectual exaltation. 
But that's something that should consume the whole man. We're exulting in hope of the glory of God that we get to see and taste and participate in. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. That's a very interesting four words. Exult in our tribulations. That, that's a cognitive dissonance sort of phrase. It would have made more sense if Paul had said, we will make it through our tribulations. It would have made a lot more sense, right? If Paul had said, we'll survive our tribulations because we know good things are coming. We'll make it through our tribulations. Our tribulations will be okay. Maybe even we have peace during our tribulations. He didn't say any of that. He didn't say we have a good thing to think about in the midst of our tribulations. Bye. 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 Have a good week. It's okay. Bye. Bye. No problem at all. Have a great week. Bye. Bye. See you. So do you see the what what the the eyes of flesh? How do the eyes of flesh view tribulation? I want this to be over. So bad. I'm so tired of this. Because it's exhausting, and it's hard, and it's painful. Whatever the tribulation that you're going through is, fill in the blank for yourself. There's a broad spectrum. There's everything from minor stresses and annoyances, all the way down to the loss of a loved one, chronic illness, uh, severe financial difficulty. Fill in the blank. But we all have tribulations. So before we proceed, take a moment, think about it. What tribulations are you going through right now? You have one in your mind or a couple? So just let's bear these things in our mind as we talk about this. Because this isn't just an abstract truth. What tribulations? Kids? Mayflower, sit quiet. Look at your book. Let mommy listen. What tribulations are you facing right now? What tribulations are you going to go home to or run into tomorrow when the week begins that this truth can speak to? You got it? Okay, so you've got your tribulation in your mind. Now, Paul says... Exult in that. What? Come again? You could have said so many things that made sense, Paul. Why did you have to say something that doesn't make any sense? You could have said, we have peace in that. We're okay with that. We will survive that. We'll make it through that. God will be faithful in that. You could have said any of those things, and, and it would have been true. But no. He says, we exult in our tribulations. We rejoice in our tribulations. That almost sounds like you don't want the tribulation to stop. Paul? You mean you're happy about it? And then he tells us why. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Do you want perseverance and proven character and hope? And patience. And patience? Mm -hmm. I do. So this is telling us that in God's hands, tribulation accomplishes things. It's actually doing something to you. He is doing something to you through the trial, through the tribulation, that in his providence would not happen otherwise. You would not grow otherwise in the way that he's growing you. Tribulation is not just you got dealt a bad hand of cards for this season of your life. And since that is the case, it's not something that we're called to try to avoid. 
If it was a, a hands of cards thing, then it would make total sense for us to think of tribulation in this, ah, uh, why me? If only I could have just avoided this. Why did this have to happen? But that's thinking like an atheist. That really is thinking like an atheist. God says, I give you your tribulations. I want you to rejoice in your tribulations. This doesn't mean that we have some sort of weird masochistic desire to be to go through trials and trauma. Jesus himself set the example in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane said, "Lord, take this cup from me." He didn't. He's. We're not advocating being a glutton for punishment. And I'm so thankful for Jesus's example because sometimes it feels like it'd be more righteous to just ask the Lord to just dump tribulation on our heads. But that's not even what Jesus did. Jesus asked to be spared the cup of God's wrath. So it's not wrong to ask that. But in your asking of that, it's easy to slip into a heart that is not content, that is not exulting in tribulation. A heart that wants it just to be over with and out of the way. It's so sad. It's so hard. It's so difficult. And I just want it to be done. Next time you think that, rephrase it in your head and say, I want God to be done sanctifying me. Is that really what you want? No. <laughs> of course not. Shouldn't be. I want to learn everything that he wants me to learn as quickly as possible. <laughs> right, yes, and that's definitely true. And I don't think that's wrong. Right? Because yeah, right. I, the, the goal is not that we, we want more tribulations. But I think the right place for our hearts to be as Christians is, well, not just think, I know from what it's saying right here, our hearts should be at peace. Our hearts should be secure. And what he's telling us right, right here is not, it's not just be secure when things are going well. But when things aren't going well, and when you have tribulations and you don't know what's going to happen and things are feeling hard and exhausting and terrible and sad and you lost someone or you can't afford your basic necessities or fill in the blank or you've got relationship difficulties or whatever. Exult in that. That peace in your heart should triumph over that. It should rejoice in the midst of that. We work towards by the grace of God and prayerfully it's not like it's not like it's magically you flip a switch and it's just easy now but we are praying for and working towards exulting in tribulation by faith trusting God is doing something here and it may hurt right now it may be hard to see right now I may be crying right now I may be exhausted right now but I am still exulting because I know I know because he promised that he's using this. He's doing something. This, tribulation is not just an abstract thing. Don't think of tribulation like you're sailing through the sea and you happen to come through a storm. But rather, think of tribulation as sandpaper that God is actively using to shape you into the image of Christ. Tribulation is not an abstract thing. It's not a, an accidental thing that God brings us through and kind of uses. It's something that God uses in us to bring about these glorious things. So we can exult in that and take great hope in that and know that that hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now in practical application, overthinkers like me can take this truth and wind up in an internal dialogue repenting of the fact that tribulation is difficult. You're not supposed to repent of the fact that tribulation is difficult. Of course, tribulation is difficult. That's why it's called tribulation. So, the point is that when you are running up against tribulation, you are taking that to Christ and responding to that by faith and singing, I will wait for you. In 
trust in the Lord. But you know what? Don't try to walk through tribulation like somebody who hasn't been justified by faith. Because now I'm in this tribulation and I don't feel about this tribulation the way I should. And why don't I feel better about it? And why don't I, I should have joy? And am I doing something wrong? And ah, 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 ah. No, go back to verse one. You've been justified by faith. You have peace with God. You stand in his grace. So when you're in tribulation, it's not an internal dialogue of making myself feel the way I'm supposed to feel. God knows how you feel. You're not going to fool him. You're not supposed to fool him. Furthermore, if you're not feeling correctly, guess what he didn't just do? Kick you out of his house now because you're not feeling correctly. That's not what it just told us. It just told us we're standing in his grace. So exult in your tribulations like a free person, like a Christian, not like someone who's trying to make it through and do it right so that God doesn't wind up upset at them. You're free. So take a deep breath and pray and give it to him and exult. It's not random. It's not accidental. It's not accomplishing nothing. He is using it. He is shaping you. You will be better because of this tribulation. You will be more like Jesus because of this tribulation. You will be refined and more effective. He will walk with you through this. And because of that, there will be fruit. There will be rewards. There will be joy. There will be tastes of the presence of God that you would not have had otherwise. And when you see it that way, you start to exult. You start to rejoice. You start to say, you know what? I'm not asking for more tribulations, but I wouldn't change it. Because I know in his hands, he is working a good thing in me. And I want that. I want him to be glorified in me. And he's working in me a person most fit to bring him glory. I think of Johnny Erickson Tata. I believe it was Johnny Erickson Tata that told her story. Are you familiar with Johnny Erickson Tata? Okay. So told her story and talked about how yeah, it was her, and it was, wasn't it? I want to bring my wheelchair to heaven. I want to bring my wheelchair to heaven. Because, and she said, I would not trade what happened to me. She had a swimming accident, and I think paralyzed from the neck down, I believe. Spent the rest of her life in a wheelchair. I mean, she's still alive, in a, you know, living in a wheelchair. And she wants to take her wheelchair to heaven. She would not trade it because because her neck got broken, and she got put in a wheelchair. She tasted of Jesus in a way that she would not trade for being able to use her hands and feet again. That gives you cause for exaltation. Doesn't mean that every Christian should desire to be a quadriplegic. That's not the point. The point is that your father knows you. Your father loves you. Your father has poured out his grace upon you. He's not going to give you the wrong trial. He's not going to mess it up. But also realize that if it was up to you, if it was up to me, I would pick no trials. And I would mess it up. Because he knows, my son, my daughter, you need this. In his grace, in his wisdom, in his providence, he knows you need this. And I'm going to give you this because I love you. And since that is what tribulation is, since it is our loving Father making us more like Jesus, that gives us great cause to exult in our tribulations. I know some mine are nothing compared to Paul's. I make mine, oh, they're so bad, but they're nothing. We got flogged or anything. Right. Yep, that is good to remember because we do have, a lot of times we do have first world problem tribulations where really we're just being whiny and it's not even really <laughs> much of a tribulation. At the same time, Scripture tells us not to compare ourselves with ourselves. 
and the Lord knows each person's tribulations and gives grace accordingly. So on one hand, it is good to keep a perspective that, you know, you could be a Christian in China, meeting in an underground church, hoping nobody comes in and starts shooting right now. Yeah, we're blessed. We have a lot of blessings to count. And so a lot of times our tribulations are first world tribulations. At the same time, they're real tribulations. And the exhaustion of a, a Christian pastor in America today is going to look different than the exhaustion of the Apostle Paul. And yeah, in some ways he's not going through the same trials. But at the same time, it's real exhaustion. The pain over losing a loved one who was 80 years old might be better than living in another country where we lost our child to typhoid. But it's still the pain of losing a loved one, right? So there's extremes on both sides. On one side, it's, oh, I'm exulting in the tribulation of stubbing my toe. I'm like, okay, really? You need to grow up a little bit and realize that life is, <laughs> life is full of difficulty and not be so whiny about life. But then on the other side, we have this, it's almost like, I don't even really have any tribulations. It doesn't count because I haven't been flogged for my faith yet. That, that's not biblical either. We have, your tribulations are real. What you're going through is real. It is really difficult. Legal proceedings, or business being shut down, or super busy and exhausted, trying to raise a bunch of kids. Those are real trials. Those are real tribulations. And that's a good thing, because from what the Bible tells us, tribulations are important. They're good for us. So it'd be a real bummer if, like, well, none of y'all's American tribulations count. Because you guys need to go like move over to China, and then you'll have some tribulations that count. That's the Bible doesn't say that. When we walk through tribulation, we don't have to guilt ourselves into why is this, this shouldn't be hard for me. This shouldn't be hard for me because Paul went through a lot more. Well, yeah, he did. But you're not called to be Paul. You're not. God has given you the tribulations you need. So, yes, set your perspective and don't be a, uh, an easily upset whiner. But at the same time, know that you're, yeah, you, well, your tribulations are real. What you're struggling with is real. And God cares about that. God's not looking at you thinking, eh, what a wimp. <laughs> Paul was way better than you, you loser. That's not the way the Lord looks at his children. Whatever tribulations, making sure he's okay. Whatever tribulations that we're going through are still subject to this promise. We don't have we're not scripturally obligated to find some to get to make sure that our tribulations are higher up on the scale of tribulation before we can claim this promise. We rejoice in all of our tribulations. We exult in all of our tribulations because of what God is using that to do in us. We have great reason to hope. Carrying on Micah's comment, comparing our tribulation with Paul's, based on everything he's written, it gives the impression that I may have more mental anguish and despair from a hangnail than he had from scourging or being stoned to death. Mm -hmm. And so that's why he wrote the passage. So, <laughs> so we could, so we could, uh, we could rejoice in our in our American tribulations. Mm -hmm. He rejoiced right. yeah. in, in his in his first century right. under the Roman Caesar tribulation. Amen. And God gives the grace that people need in different seasons. And it, it's not helpful for us to get mentally locked in this comparison game of comparing me versus Paul. Because you know what? Okay, so what? Maybe, maybe I'm a less mature believer than Paul. Odds are good. <laughs> right? But that doesn't mean that you can't rejoice in your tribulations until you're a really mature Christian and then you can rejoice in your tribulations. That's not the point. The point is start now. Whatever your tribulations are right now, exult in them. Trust the Lord with them. You see how the propensity goes right back towards this kind of works-based thing again? It goes right back to this ah, if I were a real Christian I'd have typhoid while being beaten by the KGB because I smuggled Bibles into Russia. I'm not a real Christian. And there you focus again. You're back on me. I'm not good enough. And if only I could do that, then I would be good enough. And you missed the whole point. The whole point was, 
You're justified by faith. You're exulting in hope. You're standing in grace. That's the whole point. So don't play the comparison game. Our tribulations are not given to us so we can think about our tribulations. Our tribulations are given to us so we can think about Christ. Our tribulations are given to us so we can turn to him. Not so we can look at our tribulations and meditate on our tribulations and compare our tribulations to others' tribulations to see if they're good enough tribulations to actually count. Am I at boss level tribulation yet? That's not the point. The point is walk with Christ in the tribulations that he, in his sovereignty and wisdom, he knows what you need. <laughs> so we talked about, if it were up to me, I'd pick zero tribulations, right? But that, that's, that's the pendulum. That's human wisdom on one side. But on the other side, you know there's times, for, for I'm sure most of us, when you're in the right mood, where it's like, Lord, I want to be a great Christian. Just, just give me all the tribulations. I want to... Well, praise God he doesn't let us pick. Because <laughs> depending on the day, we would either pick to have none and then miss out on all the glorious things that he's working, or we'd just pick all of them and then die. <laughs> and God in his wisdom says, no, trust me. Stand in my grace. Walk humbly with me. I'll give you what you need. I'll give you the grace you need. I'll give you the trials you need. Your heart can be secure. Your brain can just calm down. And look at Christ. And exult. And be radiant. And walk in the gospel grace that was bought for us at the cross. Let's pray.